I'm Daniel Lanois. I'm a record maker. I've been making records since I was a kid. I started when I was 12, and my brother Bob stood by me for a good 18 years, and we grew together making records. We were record makers, and I'm still a record maker today. In order to tell the story of Bob Lanois and the work that came from his cabin, we need to go back to the beginning. And I've read that your father and your grandfather both played the violin and the piano. You guys grew up with, with uncles that were singers. Your mother played the piano and also sang. And I also read that she was extremely supportive of your basement recording studio venture. Uh, what I would like to hear from you is a little bit more about your musical roots with you and Bob growing up that led to your lifelong careers in music, producing, and overall creativity. Well, music started for me in Quebec. Um, my dad plays a, played a bit of violin. My grandfather was pretty good on the violin. And on my mom's side, we had uncles that sang. So there was a lot of, a lot of old Quebec songs, a lot of them funny songs. Um, so we came up in that environment. And um, there wasn't a lot of cash to go around. So house parties were very popular. Right. And in that Quebec culture. So we were exposed to those kind of gatherings because the kids were always mixed in with the adults. You know, the, uh, they didn't separate the kids from adult life. Right. And so um, we, we got to hear a lot of the jigs, uh, a lot of the laughter, a lot of the singing um, at people's houses. And, and that, um, um, that was a big part of the, of the music that I was exposed to as a child. And then uh, my mom relocated the family to Hamilton mm -hmm. because her brother was a bartender in Hamilton. He had got things going with work and lived in a rooming house and was able to provide an apartment for us in the back of this rooming house. He eventually owned the rooming house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that was roughly the beginning. And, um, I took a liking to the clarinet, uh, something I'd seen on TV, but I, I couldn't afford a clarinet, but I managed to muster up a dollar to purchase uh, a plastic penny whistle, a little <laughs> recorder. And so that was the beginning yeah. for me. Um, and I love that little whistle and I played it, played it, played it, made everybody crazy. I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the, um, but all along, my brother was more technologically driven. So he always had an interest in electronics and what we call a breadboard. A breadboard is the an open face um, circuitry that you play around with to find your way to a design. So Bob always had a breadboard going in the house as I played my recorder. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I've told the story before. Uh, this was uh, the time of door-to-door -door canvassing and somebody knocked on my mom's door and said, uh, I represent a local music school. And do you have any kids that want to take lessons? And she said, well, this one here, Danny, he, uh, he's playing the whistle. And uh, um, I passed the aptitude test and then I was given the choice of accordion or slide guitar and I chose slide guitar. Very so good. as I, as I was sliding on the guitar, my brother was uh, continuing with the breadboards. And so um <clears throat> I was interested in the electronic part of things, but I didn't have his talent. So he was always uh, pushing the envelope of, of electronics and I was pushing the envelope of my music. So we grew up in tandem that way. Um, and then eventually uh, um, I acquired a little uh, flea market tape recorder and I started recording. Um, my own music and then some friends from the neighborhood would come over to the house and that's how the studio thing got started. Uh, Bob was not uh, there the very beginning of the recording studio. It was uh, Bob Deutsch and I that started the first studio while Bob was mm -hmm. traveling in India. Okay. Um, he had, he was going through a, uh, a time of, uh, of uh, development spiritually and studying uh, meditation and so on. So he went to India to continue with that. And when he came back, I already had the recording studio set up with Bob Deutsch. And um, that's when my brother Bob took an interest in what I was doing. 
and uh, he applied his technological knowledge and skills to that, and we started building uh, and expanding on the recording studio. So that's roughly the lay of the land of it. And that's the basement studio at your mom's house? The basement studio at my mom's house was the first proper recording studio. Although yeah. I had machines before then, um, <laughs> right, right. Uh, it started just in, in the far corner of the house, and then right. we went big to the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yesterday I had a quick call with Bob Deutsch, and he, I mean, he had some incredible things to say about your brother, and I can't wait to go meet him in person. And he talked a lot about um, the amount of work that Bob put into the Grant Avenue Studios before they were even open. Uh, so. What was the inspiration behind the idea to purchase a house and turn it into a recording studio? At a certain point, we had outgrown the basement of my mom's place because we were just making too much noise, and uh, it was a bit unfair to those trying to have a, get, a, get a good night's sleep. And um, so we thought, we thought, well, let's go big. Let's roll down the hill and go to Hamilton. Okay. Um, and... Uh, and we looked around, we were looking at um, warehouses. There was a bit of a, an explosion in the um, light industry world and all kind of uh, brand new um, warehouses happening between Hamilton and Brantford at that time. So we were considering like a, uh, a brand new location, you know, that maybe there's a... Um, you know, a seed supplier in one unit and we would be the next unit over one of those kind of places. We came close because that meant that we, we could start with a blank canvas, nice concrete floor, and we could build what we wanted. But then I found um, um, the house on Grant Avenue and it had the advantage of an extra lot. Mm -hmm. So we could park a good 15, 20 cars if we wanted. And it was very convenient for rolling in a truck and unloading equipment and all that kind of thing. So we opted for the house, but there are obvious disadvantages. You know, you have neighbors, so you can't be making too much noise. And my brother um, cleverly designed the, uh, the soundproofing in the place so that we weren't making the neighbors crazy. We managed to retain, there was a lovely stained glass, Victorian stained glass and some of the windows, and, and we hung on to that. Excuse me. Um, and he um, he poured sand in between these um, one inch pieces of plywood, and the sand was uh, part of his soundproofing technique. So he, he was very uh, he was very clever with uh, with technology, not only uh, electronically but uh, horse sense with soundproofing and so on. And in those days, you could you could buy. Um, rolls of lead I'll think of it as a wallpaper but made of lead right not the, not, not the kind of thing that would be recommended for your kids to yeah. play with and so he was able to line the walls with uh, this lead paper let's call it mm -hmm. and so the place was quite soundproof um and uh, further to all that bob built a very beautiful uh, wall separating the control room from the band room and he put a lot of time into the uh, not only the inst installation of the soundproof glass, but the uh, uh, the cork uh, mosaic that he built, a very, very beautiful surface to look at. And uh, this is where Bob was a great artist. He knew that uh, we didn't uh, we needed to accommodate late nights of recording. So you didn't want mm -hmm. ear fatigue or eye fatigue. So he put a lot of time into the eye part as well. So it sounds like, this, uh, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but this sounds like a lot of this just came from know-how and trial and error and not with some kind of like an engineering degree. Like he just thought these things up. Am I right in that assumption? Yeah, my brother was very in inventive and resourceful uh, with technology as I was with music. And we decided mm -hmm. that we would, we would uh, build this recording studio and we had never worked in a recording studio or never right. studied design particularly. It was a trial and error um, process. Um, but we saw a window of opportunity that uh, you know, I told, because I was already recording as a guitar player, I was already recording in some of the nice Toronto studios. Mm -hmm. And I found that a lot of time was wasted um, 
trying to pull microphones out of the closet and rent instruments and an entire day would go by before he even struck a note of recording. Right. Right. And so I, I, uh, I had this kind of exchange with my brother and we decided that we would look towards uh, what we heard about in Detroit with Motown, that they had what, what let's call house sound. And so they had uh, the, the drum kit nailed to the floor. So we nailed our drum kit kit <laughs> to the floor. And then we had a house bass sound. We had nice instruments and we developed house sound together. So people could walk in and get um, instant gratification from, from our setups, from, from our preparations. And Bob was a big part of that. Um, we made sure that uh, our special effects were always uh, ready to go, monitor. All the instruments were nicely maintained. Um, <clears throat> so we had, we had a little, that kind of advantage where people could come in and not even bring any instruments and, and off they could go towards a record. So, um, uh, and Bob was a great uh, um, facilitator of, of my musical suggestions. So, you know, me being the musical one of the two, I would say, well, what about this and that? And he was able to uh, respond to my dreams. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so a lot of the research that I've been doing on this project, and uh, I've, I've seen a lot of collaboration between you and Bob and the various artists that you worked with. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, Emmy Lou Harris, I believe he did some photography work with Emmy Lou Harris. Um, we'll get to you two in a second and then the tragically hip and probably more. So what was it about Bob that I'm guessing made you want to bring him in on so many of these projects with a lot of these artists? Bob always had a much better eye than myself. He was more visually driven mm -hmm. and was very handy with cameras. Um, he was always really great at taking pictures and, uh, he got good at, at making movie pictures. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I invited him to, um, to come with me and, and work with Emmy Lou Harris, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he made, um, he took some lovely stills with her, but also made a nice documentary about the process of the making right. uh, of her record called, Re uh, Wrecking Ball. Mm -hmm. And so um, his um, his very advanced eye and his capacity to notice special moments allowed him to capture uh, the kind of thing that is hard to capture as a filmmaker. But you're a filmmaker yourself. You know that being mm -hmm. at the right place at the right time and having an understanding of uh, or being the fly on the wall can go a long way. So Bob had a, uh, a lovely talent for uh, blending in and uh, everybody loved him. And so he immediately became part of the, the family of any given project that he stepped into. And so the, the Emily Lou Harris documentary is one of those. Uh, Tragically Hip, um, that evolved um, um, through his own contacts. And uh, I know that Gord Donny really loved Bob and saw him as a great artist. And they yeah, did a lot him. of lovely things together. Uh, in my absence, because I was working in Europe at the time. So yeah. I can't take any credit for uh, any of that kind of matchmaking. So <laughs> you'll have to <laughs> okay. talk to the hip about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is a good segue into the next question I have. And I, I feel like if I were you, I'd be tired of talking about you too. And I only have one YouTube question for you. And that's obviously, it's the Joshua Tree. And on the back, it says, Bob Lanois. I can't find anywhere... To tell me, what did Bob Lanois do to earn himself a credit on the Joshua Tree? I'd love to hear it from you, mm -hmm. who have to know. What was Bob's contribution to get that? Well, let's go back a little bit earlier than that to The Unforgettable Fire, which is the first record I worked on with you 2 mm -hmm. um, We recorded in a castle, uh, and we used a very nice system from New York called the FNL system. And it was one of the first uh, transportable recording rigs. Um, but when I got to, uh, to, uh, Slane Castle is where we were recording. I realized that, um, the FNL system did not include some of the nice Neve microphone preamps that I was accustomed to using with Bob back in Hamilton. So I put a call into Bob and I said, would you please rack up a dozen Neve preamps for me and mm -hmm. bring them out? And so... Uh, he was able to facilitate that request and made it so that we now had the very best 
microphone preamps for certain applications like uh, vocals for sure, drum sounds and bass sounds. So that was the beginning of his relationship with you two through me uh, by invitation. And I think that's built into uh, the Joshua tree, you know, again, facilitating uh, um, technological tricks that we were, uh, the breadboards had expanded considerably by then. And so mm. he was able to to help me out so I, so I could bring some, some of our Hamilton technology to, to Ireland. Okay, that's the answer that I've been looking for. <laughs> that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so now moving ahead a bit, in the 80s, uh, Bob sold his stake in Grant Avenue Studios. Do you know why he did that? Well, we, we both got out of Grant Avenue at the same time. Um, uh, we were... Um, we had been in recording for a long time by the mid 80s and mm -hmm. it was, you know, probably we had 15 years of recording under our belts and uh, i went for um a trip a sailboat trip with bob in the caribbean and we were on this one of these lovely little islands called uh, les saintes and on the island of les saintes he said to me that he was tired he didn't want to be chasing these dreams anymore that he wanted to have his feet on the ground and find something for himself that didn't live out there in the stars <laughs> and um and i said to him well bob you gotta follow your your um, inner voice on this and i felt that i was just getting started and i i wasn't about to stop chasing the uh, the impossible um, and so we decided to bring Grant Avenue studio to an end as we knew it. And, uh, my good friend, Bob Deutsch, he took it on and, uh, and has carried on with it to this day. And so I think it was, it's fair to say that the chapter, the, uh, of the early days and, you know, the, uh, the wide-eyed discoveries that we made uh, from the breadboards to the development of the music to embracing house sound, it had pretty much realized itself by around 1984, 85. Right. And, um, and that ran in tandem with my um, leaving Canada. I left Canada in 1983. And, um, and I think that, uh, we shook hands on on uh, the closing of a chapter and and bob wanted to uh venture off into his own um world as his artistic inclinations you know he wanted to follow his own heart and so that's it we went our separate ways to a degree we're, we were always brothers of course so we could mm -hmm. never be separated but um we felt that we had done what we needed to do with our time together at that location and uh, we we got out while we we still held the uh the heavyweight belt right, right. <laughs> hey, when i talked to bob Deutsch the other day he again spoke so highly of of your brother and he one of the questions that i'm asking everyone is what is bob's legacy and we'll get to this in a minute with you but that's what bob Deutsch said he said grant avenue studios is really uh bob lanois legacy on music is what he accomplished with uh with grant avenue studios yeah. well i i think um uh, bob doge is is pretty accurate in his in his comments that you know uh, grant avenue studio was largely my brother bob's accomplishment uh, it took a couple of years to build that place and yeah. i carried on working in the basement while uh, in the in the original studio while my brother bob um, built grant avenue Right. And so the, it was, you know, that, that transition wouldn't have been possible if he had not been willing to uh, go down there and through blood, sweat and tears and, you know, by demolition and by rebuilding, you know, <laughs> you built, a, built a beautiful place. And, and I think people really felt the, uh, the love and the uh, attention to detail that he put into that place. Um, and that's why we had such a loyal clientele that people felt as though they, they were in a place that was built by love. Good. Um, so now we're going to move on to my whole inspiration for this project, and that was Snake Road. And 
so I had learned that the Snake Road cabin was up for sale and that Margot was was selling it. And, you know, I started looking into this and I said to my, to, I had no idea that Bob Lanois, I live in Burlington. So I said, I had no idea that Bob Lanois had a place 10 minutes from where I live. I started looking into it and the history of the place and the music that came out of it. And, the, and, and I said, somebody's going to buy this and they're going to demolish Bob's cabin. Probably. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, I'd love to tell this story. And then I, I got in touch with Tom Wilson. Tom Wilson got me in touch with Margo. And I'm really realizing how much this space meant to your brother. And so that's where we're going to now shift to the, to the cabin. And I said to Margo the other day, I really wish I had started this project two years ago to hear this from Bob himself. But what I'd love to know is what made Bob want to head into the woods and build that cabin and and what in your opinion what did it mean to him was it a creative hub was it an escape just tell me a little bit of your information and your knowledge of what this cabin space meant to your brother i believe my brother wanted to have his feet on the ground as i mentioned earlier and yeah. that meant it also meant that he wanted to build his own house mm -hmm. and live in, live in it we were a family that was always on the go. You know, we, we probably had three or four different locations in Hamilton as my mom was trying to make ends meet, you know, as a uh, single mom with four kids and no help from daddy. Oh, you can just imagine the, uh, the financial yeah. pressures. And so we'd hop from one apartment to another, to another. And I think there was just something inside Bob that told him that one day he would stop the running and be planted in a place where he could uh, evolve with his ideas, with his philosophical way of looking at life. Mm -hmm. And um, which is why he never wanted to let go of it. Uh, and I'm glad he kept it right to the end. Um, he wanted uh, he wanted privacy and he wanted to be with nature. And uh, he wanted to feel some of what he remembered from some of the old timers that we knew back in Quebec, they were the Prue brothers, three of them around Lac Saint Clair. Mm -hmm. And the Prue brothers all live in their own log cabins mm -hmm. and they pretty much own the whole lake. And uh, their structures were very strong. So whenever there were big storms and we needed shelter, we'd go and visit one of the Prues and stay the night. And they were full of stories and they had no refrigeration or electricity and they made ends meet. And they could, they were really uh, some of the pioneers of that area. And I think that the Prue brothers really made an impression on Bob and that way of life and that simplicity, uh, essentially against the grain of technology. And I think there was always something in Bob that wanted to feel what it was like in those days in Quebec with the Prue brothers. That's a phenomenal insight. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so now talking about some of the work that came out of it, I, I remember your video as uh, Jolie Louise, uh, and I recognized the shack when I rewatched your video. Um, obviously, Greasy Jungle from the hip was filmed there. Uh, Tom Wilson's Shack Session Volume 1, um, his own Snake Road album. Um, do you know of any other work that came out of there? And what were your experiences and memories of spending time with Bob at this uh, at this property? The uh, the shack location was always a, a reset button for me, hmm. just to see how uh, my brother lived. We were very close. We came up together very, very close. And uh, when I went to work abroad, uh, I had to leave all that behind. But he went deeper into it. And so as the traveling uh, one of the two, when I came back, to Hamilton and visited the shack. It was a reminder about the the values of Bob always operated by and the sacrifice that I made to leave that kind of life behind myself because I could have gone that way myself. But I knew that we were on two different journeys and that uh, um, I knew that I still had something to say as a record maker. Um, I, I was very excited about the art form and its potential and Bob was very excited about being rooted and, and have more of an understanding of where he came from 
and he wasn't interested in evolving beyond that uh, in terms of acquisition or building an empire in some urban environment. He was he was very happy to be uh, in that place where he could see the deer wander and uh, he could befriend that woodpecker <laughs> and, and, uh, and be in that same place. He took so many photographs of the, through the same window. I, I wish there was a, a, a book, some kind of a, um, you know, you see these books, uh, these photos by repetition through seasons and, and Bob yes. would be the best at this because he could have a thousand pictures through the same <laughs> window and you'd be able to see uh, the evolution of, of nature through his eyes. Um, but that was the difference. Uh, I was okay with uh, going abroad and Bob was okay with keeping his feet on the ground. And I think we both learned a lot with uh, in both situations. I like. I really like what you, uh, a reset button for you. That's. Uh, I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. You get busy in your life, you you lose sight of certain things, and then you ground yourself. And it sounds like you heading to to Snake Road is what you needed to bring yourself maybe down out of the clouds, out of the stars for for a little <laughs> while. <laughs> uh, Snake Road's a long, it's a long way away from London, England. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh so I, I have three more questions for you um everybody is being asked uh this one question and i'll let you pick which one you want to answer one is and i'll ask you again if you need one is what is bob's lasting impression on you uh second what is bob's lasting impression and legacy in canadian music or music in general well, Bob's lasting impression on me is the impression he always made. Uh, um, I paid him a visit at the uh, cotton factory where he had a studio with Glenn Marshall. Mm -hmm. And he was very excited about showing me uh, his monitor system. And this is where we were, we were very much on common ground because we get excited about the <laughs> like this, you know, the frequency response and, and, uh, um, ear fatigue and, and musicality and and the quality of mixes that came out of a, a certain monitor system. And so he was very excited for me to experience what he had set up. <laughs> and then once we got all that out of the way, we went outside to have a smoke. And uh, I showed him my new refurbishment of a Harley Davidson FXR. But there was something in the design of the turn signals that bothered me. I knew they were on, but I couldn't see them, even if a car in front of me could see them. I, and he said, oh, I think I could work this out for you. So he built a little bit of a reflector system so I could see that my own signals were on for safety <laughs> purposes. So on the spot, I was he designed this for me, and I thought, that's how it all started. You could always make things better. Oh, that's excellent. In regards to his impact on uh, on the community, let's say music community, sure. um, undeniable. He he taught everybody everything that he knew. That's how giving he was. He was a great Fantastic. teacher. Great teacher. Good. Um, two more, um, and feel free to answer this or not having been gone for only seven months uh what's the void that is left from bob's passing well i can only speak uh about the void in myself yes that's exactly um, right um i will always miss the, uh, the exchange yeah okay great and do you have any final words or final thoughts that you'd like to add about your brother bob Lenoir? Um, I guess my brother Bob was the only guy I could be around uh, that would, uh, he was the only guy that could keep me quiet at any given sitting because <laughs> he always knew better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> um, last thing off, off topic now for, for the purposes of B-roll, do you recall the address of the house in Waterdown where you guys had built a basement studio? Not to go in the house, but if I wanted to show the outside of the house, do you happen to recall 
Well, the the studio in the basement was in Ancaster. Yeah, sorry, Ancaster, yeah. Yeah, that was 311 Robina, R-O-B-I-N-A. But, you know, if you go there, you won't see much because they've rebuilt. It's a new house. And so oh, yeah, okay. When we had uh, our studio there, it was just a, a it was a bungalow, you know, a one floor right. place with a basement, septic tank, sump pump. Um, but we had the best ventilation system. Right. <laughs> we had two Hamilton, what I call beer drinkers fans. You know, you get them at, uh, <laughs> at Walmart, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like two by two feet, set it up in front of the TV and you drink your mm -hmm. beer. Yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a hot summer's night. <laughs> yeah. We had two beer drinkers fans. One blew into the control room and the other one sucked out of the control room. And that was <laughs> it. And it was hooked up to a wah-wah pedal. So in between takes, you just slam the wah-wah pedal and these fans would just go crazy. And the air would be clear enough for the band to come in and have a listen back. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me add one little thing. Sure. I made a record. I made a record with my brother, Bob, and we titled it Snake Road. Mm -hmm. And given that uh, we have an interest in the cabin at Snake Road, then it deserves to be talked about. Bob is a, was a good harmonica player, but had never made a record. I said to him, um, "Let me, maybe, let me bring my international skills to Snake Road." And we agreed <laughs> to do one song per session, and that became the uh, the record. Of his I've actually record. listened to it. I love it. It's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the uh, uh, the Snake Road record has some of my debut piano playing on it. Oh, great! That's <laughs> so that's my little gift to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm um, sure you've got a lot of work to get to, so you uh, you're free to go. <laughs> you okay. can bring Wayne back. I'll bring I'll put Wayne on, and uh, you guys can um, have a last talk about the technology thank you so much for your time and and for making this film i i wish you the very best with it thanks a lot daniel have a great okay. day okay